The 25th Hour Radio Show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to the 25th Hour Radio Show today here on Monster Radio AM 1150. I am your host, Rob Fairless, and helping me out with the show today is my former sidekick, before he moved away from the area, uh, Mr. Randy Ashby. But on the phone, though, today's guest is Dr. Paul Chodas, who is the manager of the Near Earth Object Program at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech. Dr. Chodas, thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day to join me on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Chodas, I guess the obvious place to start here is to ask you uh, what got you interested in the career field that you're that you're in. You know enough that you did indeed pursue it as a career. Yeah, I uh, chose to go into mathematics, so uh, my expertise is kind of math. I was always interested in astronomy, and uh, and the math part is is in calculating orbits. So I was interested in as an early, you know, in, in high school even. How do you um, how do you calculate an orbit? How do you know where an asteroid is going? How do you know whether it's going to hit the Earth? Um, and uh, so that fascinated me as a kid. So tell us a little bit about your journey leading up to being employed with NASA at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Had it always been your goal to be a part of the NASA organization in some form or fashion, especially for someone with your interest in field of study? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as a kid, I grew up in the 60s, uh, and I remember the space program and the Apollo program. I was very inspired by all of the missions that we had in those days, and especially by the missions that went to other planets. And JPL uh, here in Pasadena, California, was... Um, was a key part of that, and they had really exciting missions to uh, Mars, for example. Uh, the first, you know, pictures of Mars I remember coming back, and and I, I can add uh, also during during the '60s, I remember um, uh, reading in the newspaper, oh, if you go out at this time, you look in this direction, you're going to see a satellite go by. This was in the early days when when uh, when the satellites were were pretty new, and there was a large balloon satellite, and I remember uh, asking myself, well, how do they know? How do they know the satellite will be there at that time? So the whole idea of being able to predict ahead of time was pretty cool to me as a kid. Um, and I had, a, I had a telescope, and I used to look around at the heavens too, but my, my fascination was, yeah, was uh, you know, how can you predict things? So your title right now is the manager of the Near Earth Object Program. For those out there who might not be aware, what exactly is that program? I mean, what are you guys and girls doing there on a day-to-day basis to detect these objects? Sure. Well, NASA has a program that is uh, designed every night to search for more and more of these near-Earth objects. Now, those are asteroids and comets, small bodies that are orbiting the sun. They're the minor planets in the solar system. Um, and most of them are between Mars and Jupiter, where there's just millions and millions of these, these guys. It's, and most of them stay in that uh, region of the solar system, but some of them, through uh, uh, through gravity and other perturbations, get nudged and slowly f- uh, work their way into the inner solar system. So we take the data, the measurements, the tracking data of where they are in the sky, and figure out what their what their orbit in three dimensions is, and then run that orbit in our computers. A lot of computer work here. We run it into the future to see if that orbit, you know, could intersect the Earth's orbit, and 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 there's any chance of a collision. So that's that's the uh, the main motivation for computing the orbits. Um, so we see if there's any possibility of a collision of one of these um, asteroids with the Earth. Now, when people think of asteroids or comets, I think the general population probably thinks it's just a rock floating around out there in space. But that's not the case, right? I mean. What you're finding out there or or what's been documented out there could be made of a lot of different types of materials. Am I right about that? Yeah, you are right. Asteroids are mostly rocky. They do have some... um some other minerals that have oxygen and some some water bearing minerals as well uh, because the, you know they formed from the original solar nebula that formed all the planets and so there was uh, there was water and all kinds of ma- um, materials in the original uh, material that formed the solar system comets formed farther out from the sun so the sun formed first and then comets formed the asteroids formed nearer the sun and comets formed farther out where there was more of these um, uh, gases carbon dioxide and 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 water and they froze to become ices so comets are kind of frozen um, ice balls you know we've seen comet uh, pictures of comets um, lately from some of the spacecraft they look rocky but they contain a lot of this uh, these frozen uh, materials water and and carbon dioxide and stuff like that so, yeah, you're right. Uh, these these things are not exactly the same as rocks on the ground here on the Earth. Um, they they contain some more exotic um, uh, minerals. 
Now, how many of these near Earth objects have you documented so far? Are you are you keeping an eye on? We are keeping track. We have oh, uh, close to sixteen thousand in our catalogs so far. If we count. Um, asteroids of all different sizes, and those are the ones um, that can come uh, in the general vicinity of the Earth's uh, region of the solar system. Um, so 16,000 is a lot. Um, um, the size that we're more concerned with is the larger ones that could uh, cause damage if they hit the Earth. So we generally use 140 meters, what is that? That's like 500, 600 feet or so uh, in diameter as a threshold size, and we count those as well. We're around 7,000, um, going on 8,000 um, at that size range as well. So um, the smaller one, the smaller ones uh, we don't worry about so much because they would burn up in the atmosphere if they would hit the Earth. In fact, we've already had uh, an asteroid that we saw in space come heading for the Earth, and this was in the year 2008. We knew it was small, and it did burn up in the atmosphere. So the small ones are not so much of a concern. There was a somewhat larger one over Russia in 2013 um, that was really, really bright. It was about 60 feet in diameter, we think. Um, we didn't see that one coming because it came from the direction of the sun. So that's there's another story there. But it also burned up in the atmosphere and created a shock wave that uh, broke a lot of windows. Um, so even that size is large enough it's small enough that it would burn up in the atmosphere. You know, we um, we start thinking that around uh, 50 meters, which is 150 feet in size, um, might be large enough that it would actually reach the ground. So those, are, if it should hit the Earth, and those don't hit the Earth very often. They they uh, impacts of uh, on the Earth of that size is very rare. Something on the order of um, you know many many um, uh, many many. Uh, centuries between impacts of that size. Now, have you found any near-Earth objects out there that could threaten our planet in the near future or even the distant future? We have found, no, there are none that pose any serious threat. There are some that we need more data on to be sure that um, that they can't hit. But when we do a probability calculation, when we run the numbers, even for those that the, the chances of uh, one of these hitting the Earth is really, really small. But I think the largest um, we've seen is kind of one in a few thousand chance for an impact many, many decades from now. So uh, that one we need to continue tracking. Um, sometimes it's hard to track these if they're on the other side of the sun. You know, they, they're in orbits that sometimes keep them away from the Earth. But... Um, but we keep we keep the number we keep calculating the numbers on all of them, and the probability of any of them in our list hitting the Earth um, is very very small. Now, is there a certain protocol you would have to follow if you did find an asteroid or comet that was on a direct collision course with Earth? Yes, indeed. Yes, we uh, first of all we work for NASA here, so we would go through NASA uh, headquarters in Washington D.C. on this, and there is a channel. Where the uh, where the NASA managers um, would communicate this up to uh, to the various offices in the in the White House. So that 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 protocol has been established. We haven't had to um, invoke that uh, protocol, but we have it ready in case in case we need it. Um, as I say, uh, the impact of an asteroid on the Earth it would be a very rare event, um, but we have to. Uh, plan for it, and we have to be ready for it in case, you know, one of the ones that we're that we're discovering, like let's say tonight, we would certainly uh, notify um, the government if that uh, if that was the case. So it we would be the government's be idea. It would be up to the government, I guess, if they were to keep it a secret, because that's a big thing on conspiracy websites and stuff. Like if there was something hidden, oh, yeah. you know, they wouldn't tell us. Exactly. I've seen those conspiracy websites myself. There is a, uh, all of the data we we have is public, and we put our results out on the web in a public way. There is um, there. It would be extraordinarily difficult to keep this a secret because the data is is uh, so available to everyone who computes uh, who does all of these calculations. So, in my view, it cannot be um, something that can be covered up for years or decades, as they say. Uh, in those on those conspiracy websites, the data is simply you know open and public. 
Now, do we have a defense system in place if there were, you know, indeed an asteroid threatening to destroy life on our planet? Or are we just going to send up Bruce Willis to take care of it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We uh, we are working. Uh, I know, excellent. We wouldn't send up Bruce Willis. I'm okay. sure he wouldn't want to go. And first, and furthermore, <laughs> we wouldn't. You know, the space shuttles and all of that are not the right way to to deflect an asteroid. We have been planning uh, what what we might do if that should happen, though. Um, and so there are some ideas, and we're actually um, in our meetings talking about these these things. And in fact, I pu- I put together some practice fictional asteroids and say, well, here, what would you do in this case? And then we have some guys take a look at, well, we could launch such and so much uh, of a spacecraft um, at this date, and we would run into it and kind of push it a little bit at this date, and then I can do the calculations to see, well, is that enough to make it miss the Earth? So the idea of ramming it with a spacecraft is um, one of the simplest ways uh, to deflect an asteroid. so when we search for our asteroids and we do our predictions, we're doing it long term. We're doing it years and years ahead to see if there's any chance that it would hit the Earth. If something is 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 uh, detected, you know, tonight and and it's headed straight for us in in the next, I don't know, week or two weeks or whatever, um, there's not really uh, um, a chance to do much about it. That's too short a time. But I have to say that we are doing a good job at finding the big ones. Uh, and, uh, and so it would have to be a pretty small one that has slipped through our, uh, our searches so far. Um, if it was heading straight for the Earth, it would most likely be a small one that would burn up in the atmosphere. That's my, that's my expectation. Hey, Dr. Chodas, this is Randy. Do you have your own personal favorite discoveries or memorable occurrences since you've been in the position that you're in? Yeah, there have been a, um, the one that I said that we found in space, um, this in the year 2008, um, a small one heading for the Earth, and we did our predictions and, and did all the calculations and determined that, oh, this one looks like it's going to hit in Africa. And in fact, within uh, that, that very day, it was that close, that very day it did hit in the, uh, the Nam- Namibian desert there in, uh, in Sudan, in Africa. Um, there wasn't enough time even to, to and it, when I say it hit, it hit the atmosphere, so it burned up as a bright meteor in the atmosphere, and we actually have a picture of someone by chance happened to take a picture of the smoke trail that was left. Um, we uh, predicted where it would hit, we, we knew when it would hit, and we um, uh, uh, had the coordinates on the ground, and, and a, uh, a scientific team went out to look uh, to see what was left on the ground, and they found a whole a field of small rocks, the meteorites left over from this, you know, original asteroid, which probably was uh, in size, it was like probably 12 feet, maybe 15 feet when it came in. But the atmosphere does a good job at breaking it up into small pieces. But there, right where we had predicted, where our mathematics said it should be, was was the uh, field of all the little meteorites, and they were recovered. So for amateur astronomers or people who who might just be interested in the night sky, uh, where can they go to get more info on the near-Earth object program as far as website or social media? The uh, We have a website, um, which you should go to, uh, neo.jpl.nasa, which is N-A-S-A, dot G-O-V. So since we're sponsored by um, NASA and the government, it's a G-O-V website. So you can go to that site, and it's got a lot of technical data there, but... Um, we uh, and by the way, we're updating that site so that uh, we will have an amped version of it. But we're having um, we provide all of our data results on all of the orbits of the 16,000 or so near Earth objects. We um, we actually even have the, imp- the close approaches. We will predict when uh, any of these is coming near the Earth and uh, say how far and uh, at what time. Um, and we have um, an area where we put the impact probabilities of those ones which have a small chance of hitting the Earth any time within the next 100 years. That's how far we generally run our predictions ahead. And you'll be able to see that there are, there are a few that we're still working on that have a small, small chance of, uh, of hitting the Earth, uh, usually many, many years away. Um, and the objective then, we'll keep tracking those and we'll get them off the list. We call that our impact risk list. Um, you can uh, check it out yourself. Um, we also have um, 
uh, I should have mentioned this, asteroidwatch.jpl.nasa.gov is, uh, is another site that gives more general introductions to, um, to what we do and can answer some specific questions. And there are Twitter feeds uh, and, and all that sort of thing. I don't know much about them, I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, all right. Because I'm not a, social, not a social media type of guy. But, um, but the Asteroid Watch uh, website is, is another good one to check out. Well, Dr. Chodas, I want to thank you once again for joining Randy and I on the show today. It's been a great pleasure having you on, sir. Thank you for having me on your show. Radio Show.